Welcome to Science vs. Cinema, I'm Andy Howell. I'm an astronomer, a film critic, and a science consultant for movies and TV. So when I see a movie like Ad Astra, man, it's got everything I want. Are you ready? Brad Pitt, one of my favorite actors. I'm ready. Big budget effects, cool space action, and yet it didn't quite totally work. It's one of those movies that almost works and it's ever more painful because it was almost there and didn't quite nail it. A quick warning, I'm gonna get into spoilers about Ad Astra, so I'd recommend seeing the movie first unless you're not gonna see the movie at all. They've built these towers that go from the earth all the way above the atmosphere. They say it's to look for life in the universe, but in actuality, you're better off looking with radio dishes on the ground that you can make really huge and steer around and collect a big signal. There are reasons to put things in space, like x-rays don't penetrate the atmosphere, so that's why we have satellites like the Chandra satellite. But the real reason the towers are there are so that Brad Pitt can fall off of one of them. He comes tumbling to Earth after a big accident, and it is a really spectacular scene. People have actually done this in real life, gone to the edge of space, and then jumped off. This guy Felix Baumgartner recently broke the high altitude skydiving record, but for decades before that, this guy Joseph Kittinger had the record. Air Force balloonist Captain Joseph Kittinger Jr. is laced into an elaborate pressure suit in preparation for a daring ascent into the stratosphere. The scientific goals of Kittinger's ascent are to test a new six-foot stabilizer parachute. The balloon reaches a height of 19 and a half miles. He went into a spin and there was so little atmosphere he couldn't control it and he actually blacked out. He only lived because his parachute deployed automatically. What can you tell us about the Lima project? First manned expedition to the outer solar system, sir. The ship disappeared approximately 16 years into the mission. And the commander was? It was my father, sir. They've sent out a mission that is led by Tommy Lee Jones's character. We're doing big things up here, real big. And he is trying to find life. What did he find out there in the abyss? But he only goes as far as Neptune. I mean, to really look for life, you need to look around other stars. It's better to just stay on Earth and look for life, not take all your instruments to Neptune. You'd have to haul these big, huge satellite dishes and massive antennas. They say they want to go outside of the heliosphere, which is the region of influence of the sun, so that the sun's magnetic field won't interfere with their instruments. <sighs> that does not make any sense. Magnetic fields don't interfere with astronomical instruments, and Neptune isn't anywhere near the edge of the heliosphere anyway. It took Voyager 2 12 years to reach Neptune, but 41 years to exit the heliosphere. But even beyond the heliosphere, you're not getting a better view of other stars at all. They're impossibly far away, so they're point sources. You might as well stay on Earth. They just go to Neptune and they're like, oh, guess there's no life. But, I mean, that is ridiculous. There's probably a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. You can't just look and then give up. The surge seems to be the result of some kind of antimatter reaction. Now, we're talking about a potentially unstoppable chain reaction here. The uncontrolled release of antimatter could ultimately threaten the stability of our entire solar system. All life could be destroyed. This is idiotic, okay? Matter and antimatter will annihilate on contact, but it doesn't make a chain reaction, okay? Once you wipe out the antimatter, your explosion is done. So the entire motivation of the movie is a really stupid idea. Again, bad physics underlying the character's motivations. We would like you to send a personal message on Mars by secure laser to what we hope is the Lima project. So he's got to go to Mars, and in this universe, you got to go to the moon first. Lunar rover set for departure to the far side launch complex. He gets on some moon buggies, and they're like, watch out, it's dangerous out there. It's like the Wild West out there. They're space pirates. Well, it looks like unidentified rovers approaching our position. Possible pirate activity. I mean, sure, you can set up a universe where there's space pirates, why not? And we get to see cool physics on another world, just like the real astronauts using their buggies on the moon. People are shooting at each other. Alpha, we need backup. 
Can you actually shoot guns in an airless environment? I did this experiment on a show called Known Universe. Will a gun fire in outer space? I've seen it in movies. They oh, don't lie. Seen the movie. they, they don't lie. never lie. Okay. It did fire. <laughs> In one of the scenes, a space buddy goes flying off a crater and has ludicrous hang time. I love it. There's a distress call and the crew wants to stop and investigate. Now, in a normal spaceship with chemical rockets, you can't stop and start again because it just takes too much fuel. In this movie, for some reason, they can. They never really explain it. There are engines today that can start and stop again, and they're called ion engines. NASA's Dawn spacecraft went to the asteroid Vesta, investigated it, and then went to the asteroid Ceres and investigated it. But the problem with ion engines is it takes forever for them to get going fast and to stop, and that is definitely not what they had in this movie. Major, I'll take trust five. Why don't you start with trust? So they board this derelict spacecraft. The humans are dead because space monkeys killed them, okay? They're like eating the people. It is messed up. Now, we have actually sent monkeys to space. At Cape Canaveral, two tiny astronauts, monkeys Abel and Baker, are ready for the first flight into outer space and safe return of Earth flight. I like seeing the monkeys adapted to the space environment. They know how to like kick themselves off and fly through a spaceship. And we've actually seen this in mice. They've taken them onto the space station and after a few days, the mice figure out how to kick off from one side of the cage and fly to the other side like Mighty Mouse. And even after a few more days, they learn to run around the cage and get like centripetal acceleration so they can feel like they're having gravity. The NASA researchers called it race tracking. Okay, like creatures invent totally new schemes for surviving in space. It's amazing. So I kind of do like that scene. Brad Pitt gets out of his monkey jam by somehow depressurizing the place that they're in and the monkeys explode. But actually, you can survive the vacuum of space for several minutes. And in fact, we've seen this in other movies like 2001, where character has to go outside without his helmet and he can live for a little while. That is accurate. I'm attempting to reach Dr. Clifford McBride. The military brass have decided that somebody needs to go to Neptune to look for Tommy Lee Jones, but they don't have a ship ready. They just use the ship that Brad Pitt just got there on. Okay, but Brad Pitt is not invited. But this ship is not made to go to Neptune. Neptune can be between 10 and 60 times farther than the moon to Mars, depending on where they are in their orbits. So imagine all of a sudden now you need 10 to 60 times more fuel and it's worse than that because you have to take a massive amount of fuel just to launch the fuel. So nothing about it makes sense. It's like if you got in your car and you drove from like Santa Monica to Santa Barbara and then you're like, I'll just drive to China, okay? You need another mode of transportation. You can't do it. It is a cool sequence when Brad Pitt stows away. This is a map of an underground lake beneath the launch pad. You'll be able to access the ship from there. That is awesome. There really are underground Martian lakes that we think we found. The problem with stowing away is that you only take enough resources that you need to get somewhere in a spaceship because air, food, everything is heavy and heavy stuff costs fuel. So Brad Pitt going on this spaceship without telling people before they launch means that he's dooming people to death maybe. And you might not even be able to reach your destination. It's just really dumb. And when the astronauts figure out, one of them pulls out a gun and tries to shoot him. Okay, this is really, really dumb. If you put a hole in your spaceship, everyone is gonna die. But believe it or not, the Russians carry a gun on the Soyuz capsules, but they're for shooting bears and wolves if they happen to land in Siberia in the wrong place, not for shooting other astronauts. What are you doing with a gun in space? Now, problem is this bullet hits a fire extinguisher. At least it looks like a fire extinguisher, some kind of little canister. It launches this gas, we don't know quite what it is, into the atmosphere of this rocket and everyone dies except for Brad Pitt, okay? He's got his spacesuit on. 
Now on the real space station, they realized that carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are not always the best idea. They, they did have them, but uh, now they've invented these water droplet fire extinguishers that are not as dangerous. I think a better idea would be if they had a fire in the ship. Can you imagine a spherical flame and having smoke through the capsule and everything else? It would have been amazing. In reality, there really was a fire on the Mir space station in 1997. One of these canisters that's supposed to produce oxygen started burning out of control and they couldn't put it out and it almost killed everyone. In fact, it resulted in the only known picture of astronauts being drunk as they partied because they survived that. So Brad Pitt gets to Neptune, which is cool because we get to see Neptune on screen, pretty amazing, but the dummy parks his ship on like the wrong side of the rings. Uh, this is nonsense. We already have robotic ships today, like Cassini, that can navigate a much bigger ring system like Saturn. Then he has to take this other little ship to go to his dad's ship. Well, when he gets in there, it seems like Tommy Lee Jones has murdered the whole crew. Like father, like son, I guess. <laughs> anyway, they have a struggle. Tommy Lee Jones gets free and decides to go, I don't know, commune with Neptune or something like that. And they don't even show him falling into the atmosphere of Neptune. That's what I want to see. They just leave him there floating out in space. No resolution. Dad, I'd like to see you again. So Brad Pitt gets on this rotating radar-like thing, pulls off a panel and jumps off of it and uses the panel as a shield to block the rings of Neptune so they don't destroy him as he gets back to his ship. Now, there's a lot wrong with this. Okay, first, that little spinning thing is not gonna give him enough speed to change orbits. It takes a huge amount of energy to change orbits. In fact, most like spy satellites and other things that we put up there, you cannot change the orbit once it's set. And second of all, the velocities of things orbiting anybody, and especially one as big as Neptune, are huge because those little tiny space rocks orbiting Neptune will rip a hole right in your spacesuit. My last problem with the movie is how Brad Pitt escapes. He sets off a nuclear weapon and then he is gonna ride the shockwave to freedom. This is a really bad idea, okay? You don't have the same kind of shockwave in space that you do on Earth. When you've seen those pictures of nuclear weapons, that shock is because of the atmosphere. Now you can use nuclear weapons for propulsion in space, in theory. There was a project called Project Orion. They were gonna chuck nuclear weapons out of the back of a ship and have a special absorber plate that would make the accelerations acceptable and you know, make it so that you didn't die of radiation and so on. But for obvious reasons, People never put that plan <laughs> into action, but Brad Pitt decides he's gonna try it without the special absorber plate or anything else like that. So it would just turn the ship to shrapnel that would blow right through his ship and boom, he's dead. Okay, really, really stupid. Even the idea of doing it just makes Brad Pitt seem like such a dumbass. And I don't want my movie astronauts to be dumbasses. They can be daring, but they gotta be smart. There's a lot to like in Ad Astra. I love going to the moon, going to Mars, going to Neptune. Brad Pitt is an astronaut. Tommy Lee Jones is his dad. The character interactions, the space monkeys, the space pirates. Keep all of that stuff, but just change the motivations. Instead of Tommy Lee Jones' character looking for life in a dumb way, just say he's an explorer. Hey, I know lots of astrophysicists that neglect their families, okay? I mean, just keep the drama focused on the characters. I like shooting a fire extinguisher, but you could make it even better. Make it a fire. You could have those towers, but actually make them space elevators. It would be so much more drama. There are ways around every single problem this movie had, and it could have been a better, more interesting, and more human movie at the same time. There's a reason it takes like eight years to get a doctorate in linguistics. It's actually like really complicated. I had to talk with the physicists. I'm like, okay, great. Okay, I see why that makes sense. Why should anyone give a flying <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to use this. This is too physics geeky. Yeah, that's the thing I've spent zero time in my life as a linguist thinking about. How do you talk to an alien? Uh, I guess the right answer is carefully.